Okay, so let's go. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming here. It's a pleasure to be here uh, again um, in Bangalore to <coughs> talk about functional programming. Um, so this time I'm here to um, talk about a language uh, called Rust. So I'm curious who uh, never heard of Rust before. Is there anybody that never heard about it? Okay. And uh, did anybody here already use Rust to write some stuff or anything? Yes, two people, okay. Um, okay, so Rust is, um, is a system programming language in the vein of C or C++. So um, I guess most people here, did you already read some C code, right? Uh, yeah, uh, can you write some C code? Who, who think can write some C code? Yeah, some people, yeah, most people, right? But do you think you can write safe C code? <laughs> Right, because it's the thing. Once you start using C or C++, you're like, okay, I can write efficient code, uh, but to make it safe, it's complex, right? There's a lot of ways that you can make things wrong. Um, so Rust is an alternative to these languages, and it brings some really nice features, which actually, even if it's in the vein of C or C++, I think it is actually a, a functional programming language. So some of these features uh, uh, that I will show uh, uh, today, there's a, a pattern matching and algebraic data types, high order functions, and it's also immutable by, uh, by default. And, and these things really bring, uh, bring some nice abstraction in the language. There's also some good uh, uh, tools to deal with concurrency, and I mean, the big thing about Rust is really deterministic uh, resource management. So it means it, it runs without a uh, garbage collector, but you can still write your code you know, without having to do all the malloc and free stuff that you would usually have to do in C and C++. And the goal, is to be as fast as C++. Not necessarily as fast as C, because when you write C codes, very often you can do fine grain optimization, right? You can tune things re really nicely. Um, but really as fast as C++, and even sometimes faster than C++, and even in some cases faster than C, because of some optimization. Uh, I won't go into that detail, because I'll more show you know, what, what is functional in, in, in Rust. Um, <coughs> so why learning, learning Rust, right? Because, I mean, if I can, I would use Haskell, because that's my favorite language. Uh, but there is some stuff that uh, are really difficult to do with a language like Haskell. Like for example, let's say, <coughs> well, an extreme case will be you want to write an operating system. Well, okay, maybe not everybody want to write an operating system. But maybe you want to write a, a hardware driver. Maybe you want to interface with some hardware you're building. Then, well, you would have to write some C code if you had to do that. But actually, today you could rest to do that. Uh, you could use Rust to do that. Another one would be, let's say, writing li like a, a runtime for programming language, like a virtual machine. Uh, for example, Java, you can find some pieces of C code in the JVM, uh, even if they try to replace you know, with a new uh, just-in-time interpreter. There's a lot of, uh, of C code in the JVM. So if we could instead use Rust to do that, I think that would be good. But otherwise, if you can use Haskell, you know, just use it. Um, so just to share about a bit my, my own experience, I. I always wanted to do some systems programming, but I was always afraid of using this C++, C stuff. So uh, even if I had stuff I wanted to do, I was like, ah, oh, no, no. And I got some hope years ago when Google says, oh, we'll release a new language, you know, uh, low, low language. And, uh, and at first I got excited, but then, I mean, I don't know if you use Go, but uh, like generic programming, it's, there's no generic programming. I mean, it's like template based. So I was pretty disappointed by that, and I had to wait until that Rust come out to, to actually change my mind and start doing some system programming. So I will just give you a brief history of the language, where I come from, we use it, how is it used, and then I will show you uh, the functional feature of Rust, uh, and then I will show you what is kind of dysfunctional about it, because um, as Eric Mayer says in uh, his paper, um, I think it's the curse of the excluded middle, if you don't have effect tracking and lazy evaluation, you won't really get the full-fledged functional programming. So I will show you what is the, this thing that you don't get and what kind of features you can have. And then at the very end, I will show you um, some practical Rust features that are not necessarily very functional, but that help a bit. Some are kind of functional, but halfway, half-baked. I, I will show you that. Um, so first, just a little quote. Uh, maybe some of you know the, the book of Mozilla. It's not a, a religious book, right? It's just an Easter egg hidden in a in Mozilla that tells the story of, 
of Firefox, basically. It's a Easter egg in, in Firefox. And that one was added, I think, uh, two weeks ago. If you do about Mozilla, you can, you can read it. And basically, it, it described the oxidant metal is Rust. So it described that Rust is now, uh, f uh, Firefox is now using Rust internally. So how did that went? Uh, first, in 2006, there's a, the original author of the language, Graydon Hor, that um, started hacking on it on his spare time, really, just a hobby project. Um, 2009, Mozilla decided to sponsor the, the, the project, and the first release happened in 2010. But really, people started to hear, hear it more around 2012, um, because Mozilla decided to uh, start uh, uh, writing a new uh, web browser engine, called Servo, maybe you heard about that, which is completely written from scratch in Rust. Um, and the idea is to replace the current uh, Gecko uh, rendering engine in Firefox with this new one, which should be much faster. Uh, probably if you used Firefox Chromium in the past, you were like, oh, Firefox is slow, Chromium is fast. But that changed like very recently, like two weeks ago, because they released like a, a, a Firefox Quantum. So Servo, take a lot of time to be designed. So they decided to create a, another project called uh, Firefox Quantum, which basically took part of Servo and put them into Firefox. So now if you use the latest version of Firefox, you will see it's actually much faster because they do a lot of parallelization. And all of this code is written in Rust. So the story which is funny is that they tried, I think, three or four times to put parallelism into Firefox using C++, but they failed. They already had issues, it didn't work. And when they do use Rust, it works at the first time. So I think it's a, you know, it's a nice success story about, about this language. So now let's go into, into the real stuff. I will show you a few, uh, a few functional uh, features of the language. So first thing, it is immutable by default. Which means if you declare a variable using that let syntax, if you try to assign something on it, you will get an error, an error completion error, right? You cannot assign twice to an immutable value. If you want to do something mutable, you have to use a mute keyword here. So kind of like what you have with val and var in, um, in Scala, for example. So by default, it's immutable. That's already a big shift for people. Uh, because keep in mind that this is targeting not really people like us, but people like that were doing uh, C and C++. So that's already quite a big, uh, big change for them. Um, so as a what is a great feature is that you have first class functions, really function as value. And we will see in detail what I mean by function by value because Rust is pretty neat into optimizing these things. But it means, basically here I create a, a, a lambda function that take A as a parameter and I just do an addition here. So something as well that we can see here, this code works and compile because there's a, a local type inference going on. So here I just add the type, right? And this is a type definition for, for a function. The syntax is a bit uh, maybe surprising at first. The first parameter of the function have that fn word, and then there's our to describe the, the return type. Um, so that is for, for the, the first class function, but it, it's brought as a closure. So closure, in me, it means it's a function that actually capture some stuff from the autoscope, right? So here, I just, instead of having one directly in line in my lambda, I just put it outside if the, in the environment, and this works. But if we try to put back the same type we had before, that won't compile. It, it will tell you, oh, um, um, here f expect a fn uh, integer of 8 by bits to integer of 8 bits. But you actually give something, and you get that weird type here, which says closure at, and it gives you literally the line where the closure is defined, and then you have the list of things captured in the environment. So you can think about it like, uh, when you define a closure, it gets a type which includes in it all the dependency it has, right? So this type here is really a pure static function when it's f lowercase, which means you can only pass something that, you know, is, is, is totally static. But once you change that, actually the type change. So how can you, how, how, how did work, how did the language designer work around that, you know, to give you a way to, to be able to abstract a, a uh, over that, oh, oh, can I pass a, a, a closure here? So now let's see, to, to show this example, let's see how higher order functions work, right? Um, so you can actually write a higher order function that accepts one of these, uh, these functions, uh, the same function as we wrote before, right? So it takes a, a one, one integer and it simply applies two times the function to the thing you give, right? 
You give something, you give a function, you take the function, apply two times, and return the integer. Um, so it's all good. We can define our function like this with the one in line, right? So there's no environment, nothing. It, it works fine. Um, but what if we, if we actually uh, extract the value? So we cannot use it at the same time as before, right? Because we would have a, a similar completion error uh, as this. So what Rust does here is that it uses actually a parametricity and polymorphism on the function type to uh, um, allow you to be able to pass different sort of functions, right? So here now I, I change the type of function to f, which is a type parameter, right? And then here I give a constraint. I'll explain more in details about this constraint. You can think it's like a type class, sort of. So you say, okay, f, uh, as a constraint of the type class fn i8 to i8, and this time the f is uppercase. It's uppercase because it's a, tra it's a trait. So trait, type class, you will see later, it's kind of the same thing. Um, so now it's, this code is generic over the function type. What does it mean? It means that, um, so something which is important to, to understand here is that, you know, such type, uh, when you use list, when you use closure, Haskell, everything like that, when you define a closure or a function, it is actually a value in the heap, right? It's heap allocated. But when you do that in Rust, it is not. Really, when the compiler uh, uh, generates your program, it will inline and link everything as much as it can statically. So by making this, oops, sorry. By making this polymorphic, when it compiles, if it's called from something where the, 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 sorry, where, where, where the function is, uh, is static, it will be, actually there will be no heap allocation at all. And that's a big deal for performance. But you can also pass something that needs to be heap allocated. We'll see later how. But by making it polymorphic like that, you can, you can do both and still get you know, a, a, a good performance. Um, so there's one thing here that in all the examples I gave, I just define the function here and then I use it straight away. But what if you want to uh, uh, hand out a function from um, uh, another function, right? Which is like, you have the return type, which is a function. So, so then you have to heap allocate it. I mean, there, there's no other way. It's, it's the way it is done, right? As soon as you want to have <coughs> that function and pass it around, you, you need to uh, allocate in the heap. So there's a type called box, which explicitly box something, right? It can be a function, it can be a value, it, it can be anything. As soon as you use box, you move from the stack to the heap. But you do it explicitly, so you, you know, you keep a, a good understanding of, um, of how the resources will be unload and how you can optimize things around. Um, so here I just have a, a, a function that takes that one that we had before, but now we can pass anything we want. It will create that, that closure and it will return it. Uh, here we have to use the keyword move to let the, the compiler know that we want actually to borrow the context because we will, if you don't use move, you think that this will be uh, uh, unallocated at the end of the scope, right? But actually, no, we want to put it in a box, so we, we want that to survive, right, the scope of the function. So then we have to use the keyword move that will make that move in the, in the heap as well. Um, so then I can define my one, create my function. So then I receive my box, and then I can call uh, my higher order function, but uh, my higher order function does not accept a box, right? It accepts a function. But there's a, a method as ref that actually borrow the ownership of the function and pass it to the other one. So you can only uh, um, have one ownership at a time, but we will see more uh, about that later. So this convert from box T to actually a reference of T, right? So as it's polymorphic, it will accept as a, a, a reference to the function. Um, so yeah, so actually uh, a closure like this is exactly like a closure in a traditional functional language. It's, it's heap allocated. So no, another <coughs> good feature uh, which seems really functional when you see it from Rust is iterators. Um, so you can think about iterators as what uh, Ordersky tried to do, for example, in Scala with Vue, but probably nobody used it because it's half broken. Um, so it's basically a lazy uh, collection that you can um, yeah, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lazy iterator, and you, and you find all these traditional uh, methods that we have usually on list on, a, on functional programming uh, language. Uh, but it is lazy. It means 
you have to start by transforming. So vec is like this. It's a vector. It's a general type for, for list in, in, uh, in Rust. But first, you have to get an iterator out of it. But when you do that, nothing happens, right? Just get back a function that allows you to describe what you want to do. But nothing run yet. So then you, you, you say what you want to do. So I take that excess list. I zip it with ys. So zip it will you know, make a, a list of tuple of these two elements. Uh, then I just simply map them to multiplicate them together. And then I can filter them just to keep uh, uh, this here. So if it were not lazy, it will actually do, woo, I don't know, three, four pass, you know? Every time you, you could, I mean, you do iter zip, you will zip things together. Then you call map, it will again pass through the list, blah, blah, blah. But here it's not the case. Because it's lazy, nothing happens until you, you call collect. And when you call collect, actually the computation is run and the, the actual data is, is retrieved. So this is pretty neat because, um, I mean, usually when you were in C, C++, you were just doing all this mutable thing with for loop and blah, 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 and moving the stuff around, right? Uh, and then you were like, okay, but if I want a, a better user experience, basically I lose efficiency here. But here, I mean, this is exactly the same as the C or C++ code, right? So there's no reason anymore to, to, to write this ugly mutable code because you will actually get the exact same performance in here, and I think that's great. So it's like fusion, right? Um, so another core feature that makes Rust uh, quite functional is algebraic data types. I mean, that's the bread and butter, right, of what we do, of course. Um, so here, just a simple example uh, where I encoded the, the same maybe as, um, as in uh, Haskell. So it's called enum, like enumeration, where you, you, you define your, your type with a type parameter, and here you give the type constructors, right? So let's see how we can use them. Uh, we use them with pattern matching, of course, right? So syntax is kind of similar to, um, to uh, Haskell in some ways. So you match on the value, and then you have to, to give the case. So of course, if you forgot one of the one, uh, one of the case, you will get a compilation error, right? Telling you, hey, you have to, to, to deal with that. So you deal with that, and then it works. So that is, you know, extremely useful to, to write safe, uh, safe application. Um, so let's see. So it supports as a recursive data type, but it's not as trivial because if you define, uh, so nat is like natural number with the church encoding, you know? It's like you have zero, and then uh, one is a successor of zero, two is a successor of successor of zero, and you can encode numbers that way. You know, it's a neat way of, uh, of encoding numbers. So if you want to do that in Rust, and you just put it this way, it will tell you, well, I cannot compile this because Rust is not lazy, right? Rust is a strict language. So there's no way here it can build something like that because for him that will be infinite in terms of, of, of space. S because, uh, yeah, let's keep in mind everything like this is not heap allocated by default. So to make it work, you actually have to box the, the, the records, the, what, what makes the, the, the recursion in your, in your data structure. So once you put a box here, it compiles and then you can work with it. So, um, I mean, it makes sense, right? If you want to have a recursive data structure, you will have to allocate a reference on the heap to keep track of where you are. So here you, have, you are explicit about it, right? Um, then we can write a, a, an add function. So the reason I show it here is just to, to show that, um, so when you create a value, you get ownership, ownership of that value. It means that you have to take care of releasing it, not you, but the scope in which where you are. Um, the thing is that because we work with a box inside, as soon as we want to do a method that do addition, to get something from a box, as I showed before, we can do only as ref, right? So we get a pointer to it, right? So there's no way that in a computation where we work with pointers, we can create new values. Because there's no way to create new ownership to give back to the, to the parent scope, right? So we actually do have to implement it in a mutable way because this way we can accumulate the numbers in, the, in this one. But that does not mean that then we have to expose that in a mutable way. Because then later, so I won't go in detail of the implementation, but it's just to explain that it has to be mutable. Um, but later, I oh yeah, forgot the, the example. Later we can add another interface that is immutable and where you just have the plus operator and you, know, you don't have to think about that. But this is you know, some kind of the thing where where Rust will guide you, you know, really often when you start using it, you're like, oh, the compiler is always telling me I'm doing things wrong, right? And you have the feeling to fight against it. But then 
after you get used and you start to understand all this borrowing semantic, it feels like it's taking you by your hand and showing you, hey, look, here. You really want to do that? Maybe you want to do this. Maybe, maybe you know, and, and it helps you to improve your, your, your program. Yeah, so it can be uh, encapsulated later. So type classes. Uh, so they are not called type classes. They are called traits, but it's literally the same uh, approach. For example, um, there's no inheritance in Rust. You cannot really do object-oriented programming. You can do some ways of object-oriented programming, but let's say it's not really encouraged that way. You know, it's more like, well, let's do a, a ad hoc polymorphism, like, uh, like in Haskell, basically. So here I show you can encode uh, um, just a simple uh, basic hierarchy of semigroup and monoid. So you know you define your function, and then you can have a, a subtype uh, a relationship. But the, the subtype relationship is only at the type class level. It is not at the at the data level, right? Like in Haskell. Um, so this is how we, you define some uh, type classes, and then you have to implement it for some types, right? So here we implement it for the uh, um, unsigned uh, integer. And just give a you know simple uh, simple implementation, and there, and there we can see how we can use this stuff. Then you just import the trait, and you have uh, access to all the the method. So it's nice because you can have you know this um, this type class method that does, does not take an instance, right? They are totally static. So you say empty uh, inside integer eight, and you will actually get that zero value, and then you can append another value to it, and you will get uh, your result. So that's pretty much like, uh, yeah, it feels a lot uh, very functional, right? So there's another feature which I found uh, uh, interesting as well. It's called associated types. Um, for me, it feels a bit like type family in, uh, in, in Haskell, if you've seen that. So basically, I, I'll give a concrete example. Uh, here, let's say we have a graph types, right? So we have two type parameter, one for the edge, one for the nodes. Um, now we create a new function that um, will compute the distance between uh, um, two nodes. But we have to define E, because it's part of the, of the main type, right? So even if here we don't use E at all, we still have to, to deal with it at the, the type parameters level. So what associated types allow you to do is to actually, in a type class trait, to have some abstract type numbers, right? So they are there, they are, they are defined, but you don't have to explicit them when you talk about graph. You can pass a graph around, but you don't have to, to talk about this type. Maybe you've, if some of you have used Scala, maybe you've seen that. You know, it's like these abstract type numbers in, 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 in Scala. Um, but actually done better, I think, because it, it works, I mean, the inference works well, et cetera, et cetera. So then when you implement a graph, you actually define these, these types, right? That pretty much feel like as well like the, the, the type family. And then when you define your distance function, you don't have to repeat any of the types. You can just, uh, you actually use colon colon to, to, to get the reference inside the, the, the value. So it feels, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty useful. And it's allow you to, to you know, avoid showing some types to the user, but still get the inference working and all, and all the, the, the fancy stuff. So that is for all the nice functional features. But I, by, uh, Intentionally, I didn't show you some limitation, and now I will show you some limitation. Because if it was exactly like that, you could do, well, you could literally code very close to Haskell, right? But sadly, there's, a, there's some important limitation. The most important one for me is the lack of higher kind of types. So that's really a big deal. Uh, for example, if you want to define functor, I would love to define functor like that, right? Here I have f, which is a higher kind of type. So it takes another type. It could be option, could be list, could be blah, blah, blah. And then I would have map where I would, I would uh, uh, put, you know, fill the hole with another type. But sadly, this, that won't compile. Um, so did, you can try to implement uh, some uh, air candidate type class like uh, uh, monad and functor. Th there is some experiment. If you look up on Google, you can find people trying to encode this stuff. Um, it's kind of like, uh, like how you could, you know, you, you have a trait for monad and you inherit from it, blah, blah, blah. But it's, I mean, it, it doesn't work well. I mean, the inference doesn't work. You can get some example working where, where you can use some monad instance, but as, as soon as you write, you want to write a piece of code which is generic for any monad, you won't be able to do it. And that's the whole point of it, right? I mean, if you can do that, then what else? 
So you, you will find online, if you look up for it, some people doing some experiments, uh, uh, writing some monads, some functor and stuff like that, but really just playing around. But there is hope. There is a, a RFC which is open for maybe a few years now. And when I looked it up these last days, there is actually new stuff going on. So people, it seems people really want to get it. Uh, there is a strong really interest for it. I think it's the highest uh, uh, things in the, you know, in the uh, request that people ask for. Um, it's really not trivial because to do that and to keep good performance, it's, it's a challenge. So they, they, if, you, if you're curious, you can look at this RFC and you will see what is currently going on uh, in Rust to get there. So there's a, a few uh, features that have to be added and people started working on it. So there is definitely hope. So what is also dysfunctional, but uh, might be obvious from what you've seen before, but there's no effect tracking. So basically uh, you can define a monoid instance and in your empty instance you can do whatever you want, right? So I can print in the console, I could do launch a rocket, right? There's no way that will be tracked. But you know, I mean, uh, there's really few programming languages that actually deal properly with that. But uh, yeah, this is sad. Uh, I think, you know, maybe by having a higher kind of type, maybe it will then be possible to design libraries that will help with that. In the same way that you have libraries in, uh, in Scala that can help with that. Uh, Eric uh, uh, will show uh, that in, in his, his talk as well. Uh, yeah, so I would really love to have a higher kind of type, obviously. Uh, something else which is a bit crazy <laughs> is the variance rules that remind me of the variance rules of, uh, of Scala, actually. But uh, it is a bit crazy because uh, um, there is two sorts of type parameters. There is the traditional type parameters, as you see here, and then there is the lifetime uh, type parameters. I will explain that more in details later, but that gave rise to a good amount of complexity. If you want to go into the details of the type system and how it works, um, well, there's variance, and that makes things uh, a bit complex. So when they call variance, it's actually covariant. There's only covariant or invariant, but, um, but anyway, just to show that, you know, it's not that simple to make, to, to get, trying to get the best of, of both worlds. Um, so this was the main, you know, the big, uh, big pain point uh, I have with, with Rust. And now I will show you a few of our features. This time they are not like, you know, like what you will see in purely functional language. It's more like trade-off that they choose to have, but pretty useful. There's some pretty useful stuff when you are uh, in the wild writing code. So first, error handling. So there is a results type, which is like a, like a either, or you've seen that in, a, in other languages, right? Um, it just swapped to what you're usually, what you usually see. So if it works, it's this side. If it fails, it's this side. And then you have two types, return, OK, or error. So this is a core uh, uh, type in REST. It is used, you know, in all the, the standard li li library everywhere. So let's see how we can use that, right? So I just define a type user, it's a fake type, just to play around with functions and, and define stuff. I define an algebraic data type for my error, right? It's something we usually do when we do a functional programming because we can track exactly what's going on with pattern matching and everything, this is great. Uh, so now I define two functions, one which is about uh, uh, logging a user. So I give a user ID, which is just an integer here, and I get a result, the user if it works, or I get an error. And then I have another function which uh, will extract the name from my user, hypothetically, you know, from a service, so I don't know what, but here just a fake implementation just to show you how you can use this stuff. So now that we have defined this, we can actually use this method, right? So let's say I want to print the name for a given user ID. So I can log in, and then I can go, and then get the value, and call my other function get name, right? Which was also returning a, a, a result, right? So it will actually, if it works, it will pass this around. If it doesn't, it will fail directly, you know? Like, like this, you really, this either and, or validation type you may have seen in, in other language. Uh, so here it's really functional style, right? Actually, this is flat map, right? This is bind, but uh, there's no monad, so, you know, it's, it's specialized. And then I map and I, and I, and I print the name. So, Something I want to show from that is that there is an alternative syntax. Maybe you heard of, if you did some Idris, um, I don't think it, it actually was implemented in a Haskell. It's called the, the idiom brackets. So there's a paper from uh, uh, Conor McBride where this was uh, uh, described. 
Um, so here, actually, it's like if we have uh, um, idiom brackets. So what we can do is that we can directly call login, put a question mark here, and actually here, it's like if I have user, it's not anymore if I have a result. In fact, at the end, there will be a result, but for a small amount of time, I can stop thinking I'm in that result thing, and I can just work with my values, you know? And that's pretty useful because you, sometimes you just want to write that code more shorter, especially if you have a level of nested results. That, become, uh, that became really handy. And it's funny because it's actually something that the only place I've seen it implemented is, is in Idris, you know, which is quite an advanced uh, functional uh, programming language. The big difference, though, is that here, this is completely specialized for results. In Idris, it works for any applicative, you know. But here again, we don't have applicative because we don't have a candidate type, so we are limited this way. But we can hope that later, it might actually be, be more general. But I found that to be a really, um, really useful feature. Um, so now let's talk a bit about uh, lifetime. Lifetime, if you get into Rust, really take time to read about lifetime because it's the big thing which is different from the rest. You know, it's like you have a type system, you have, a, you have the, the type parameter, but you also have lifetime types, you also have lifetime inference, and that is what is called the borrow checker. So the borrow checker is what is, um, you have the type checker, and then you have the borrow checker. The borrow checker will check if the ownership is, works properly in your application, and that rely on, on lifetime. So really, when I was starting uh, uh, learning Rust, the, the big pain point was this, because I was like, okay, don't read documentation, let's just go and you know, write stuff. But this, is, it's worth you know, learning uh, uh, about properly. So when you write actually foo like this, it actually have an implicit type hidden. Even if you don't write this, this type parameter here, it exists. So the, the difference with a lifetime type parameter and a normal one is that it starts with a, that quote and it's a lowercase, okay. Um, so now let's see when you have to use it, you know, a concrete use case. So let's say you have two structure, foo and bar. Bar uh, actually uh, include foo and foo have an integer in it. So now you write, so, Lifetime is really important when you deal with uh, references. Because when you, deal, when you pass stuff by value, well, it's clear that you pass the ownership with it. When you pass a value, the, the function that receives the value will take care of uh, releasing it later. Because it means if you pass it by value, you, you cannot do anything with it anymore, right? So you pass the ownership. And then at the end of the stuff that receives the ownership, Rust will deallocate automatically. We will garbage collector, right? To keep that in mind. So now if we, if we work with, um, with references and you have a function that takes two value and return another value using references, Rust actually is unable to know um, what will be the ownership of this. Will it be the ownership of this one or this one? The reason you have to know is because once the caller gets back that value, it needs to know when to deallocate it. Should it delocate it at the same time as this one or this one, you know? Because then it will track the scope in the, in, the, in the parallel scope. So if you write the code like this, you will have an error message telling you, here, missing a, a lifetime specifier. You have to tell me, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I think it could infer that in some case. But it seems it's not, I don't know if there's some uh, work to be done, but I think he could be a bit smarter sometimes and, and, and infer it uh, by himself. So now let's see how we fix this. Here it's a simple case um, because they, they basically all have, they must have all the same ownership because you might return one value or the other. So you, you, you only know at runtime, right? Let's keep in mind that all these types and in front here, it's all compile time, right? So here we just simply add a new type parameter and we assign it to all of them to say, okay, it will be the same ownership, you know? They, it means that when the caller uh, call here, these two value, oops, sorry, that should be B2, but um, they must have the same ownership. And then the resulting value will have the same ownership and then he knows how to deal with that. So let's take a different uh, case where this time we have a method that just take, uh, um, that you pass this two value, but it will return the first. You know, it will discard the second one. It will return only the first. Or you could ask why, you know, but you could say, well, maybe I have to do something with the second one. And, 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 but then I, I won't actually return it, but I still need it to get some information. And I don't know what. So if you do it like this, you will again, you know, same shape, you will have uh, the same error message. Um, but this time, here is how you fix it, right? 
As this is the first one that you return, you actually assign the top parameter here. You don't have to put anything here because it will be inferred. And then you put it on the, on the region thing. So what if you did it wrong? Oops. Ah, yeah, it's here when you do it wrong. When you do it wrong, if you, for example, you, you return A, but you say that the lifetime is B, you will get an error. You know, that will be checked. That's why I think that could be inferred in some way, right? It seems like it should be possible. Um, so something which is pretty good uh, uh, about Rust as well, and that helps a lot when you write all this low-level stuff, is the tracking of mutation. And so for me, even if Rust has no effect tracking, I can get some of the safety of effect tracking by tracking mutation. Uh, and that is actually a good example, for example, with, with, with file. Um, because you can write function that receive a file, but like use his name to, I don't know, compute a path, compute something else. Or you could pass a file and actually read or write from it, which is an effect, right? So here, if you pass a file like this, and then you try to read something from it, you will actually, uh, so it's here where we, we create the file and then we pass it to the function, right? So we'll, you will actually have a narrow message telling you, hey, you cannot read from this file, you know? Because you, it's an immutable uh, reference, but I need it to be mutable. Because in the definition of this function, file must be mutable, you know? So then when you compile, well, it doesn't work, right? I, I, I want this to be mutable. And that's pretty good because it gives you already quite a bunch of safety. So if you want to make this code compile, you have to tell explicitly that you receive a mutable file. And of course, here you have to make the file mutable. And again, if I were ca calling the function without this, it will make it immutable. So even if you have a, a mutable uh, reference in scope, when you pass it around, by default it became immutable. You have to be explicit about making it, which is, I think, great, you know, because you have to think when you, when you pass something mutable. Um, yeah, so that's it about, about mutation tracking. But by using that, you can, in your API, you know, add safety and, and, and use this feature to, to make things more safe. And it's extremely useful when you do uh, I.O. stuff. So one other really, yeah, sure. Is there different types for mutable, like different uh, mutable file type in mutable file type, or is this a keyword that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So there's uh, only one keyboard for, uh, one keyword for the data types. So it's only just mute for the, for the data types. But when we talk about function, it's different. So before we saw the fn, you know, uppercase. So actually there is three of them. There is fn, fn once, fn mute. Um, we'll see fn once later once I explain the next step. But fn mute, basically, if you want to pass a closure that will mutate something, it's a different type. Uh, but for values, it's just this keyword. And then it works for everything. Um, yeah. So now the really, really interesting feature, you might have heard about that. Some people sometimes say that uh, Rust has linear typing. It's not exactly true. It has affine types, so just quickly explain the difference, right? Maybe you never heard about linear typing before. Linear typing is being implemented right now in GHC, so it's something we will have in Haskell soon. Uh, basically, linear types is to say, so the, the global definition is that you have a function that have an argument, and if it's a linear type, that argument has to be used exactly once. If you don't use that argument, that won't compile. If you use it twice, it won't compile. So now the difference with affine type is that um, you, you can use it at most once. So affine type is what? I, I say affine type, but it's really when you pass the, the ownership, right? You can only pass one time the ownership, because once you give it to someone, you cannot get it back. That person keep it. You could give it back, but doing a copy of the value, I mean, returning again the value, right? But, but, but then you, you, you lose it. So this gives you, give us something really nice because um, we, we can do same stuff that people do with linear types to make things more safe. For example, here again, we have that same code that read a file, okay? Um, usually you don't have to use drop. Drop, what it does, it closes the file. Once you finish working with the file, you're done with it, you want to release resources, you call drop. Usually you don't because it will be called automatically at the end of the scope by the finalizer, you know. But, well, sometimes maybe you want to do it explicitly because for performance reasons, right? Um, the thing is that dr uh, drop, unlike most of the other uh, file function, uh, it accepts file as a value and not as a reference, right? 
So if I do this, it will actually not compile. It will create, uh, generate a compilation error here, telling me that, well, you try to use file. You try to pass file around, right? But you cannot, because you actually already gave it to someone else. So here, the compiler tracks who own a file, right? And he knows that at this point here, file is not no owned by me anymore. I, I'm not allowed to do anything with it. So if I try to close the file before reading it, I get a compilation error. And I think that is, you know, that is really good. Um, so to fix this code, I have to put it at the right place. And then, and then it compiles. So I discussed about uh, a box before. Uh, there's a few others of this wrapper type that help you to reason about uh, how it's used in memory and stuff like that. So box is to explicitly heap allocate something, okay? Uh, usually it's, one you, it's when you want to hand out a value uh, uh, back to, to, to the caller, uh, but you cannot create a reference because you, you, know, you, you cannot create an ownership like that. There is an arc, which is uh, because if you try to, to share a box or anything between two threads, that won't compile either. Because again, it tracks the ownership, and Rust is able to understand that the ownership moves from one execution context to another. So you will get compilation error. Sadly, I didn't have time to get into the concurrency stuff, but there is a structure called ARC that allows you to deal with that, still without garbage collector, you know. And the very last one is um, reference counting. So let's say you really need to share a value between, uh, uh, you, you really need to give ownership of the same value between different methods, different thread, I don't know. Uh, then, well, that, that happened, right? Then you have this, this structure, which will use reference counting. And, you know, that, that, that way you can share that, like you usually share in any, any other language. <coughs> but, of course, it's good to try to avoid to use that, because when you want Rust, you want performance, so you want to avoid... This has runtime cost, right? Because once you start using this, <coughs> when you want to get a value, we'll have to check who is using it or not, blah, 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 all this stuff. So, you know, it, it, it can beat performance quite a bit. Just the two last thing I want to, to, to show you that I found really useful in Rust, and I actually, I don't think I ever saw that anywhere else, is that there is a testing integrated directly in the language. So you don't have to download a test library or anything, you don't have to have a, you know, tools to run tests, you just have some annotation that you put here, and, and you can then do cargo, cargo is a build tool, you know, you cargo test and it will, just run your test. So you can inline test directly in your code. You can make a different module with your test. It, it, it all works like that. Same thing for benchmarks. I mean, i never seen a language that includes a benchmark uh, system directly with, with itself, right? And that's pretty cool, because usually when you write Rust, what do you want? You want things to be fast. So here you can directly test if it's fast, and it gives you like what is called a bencher, and you, you iter on it, and then Externally, you can configure the bench how many times you want that to run and stuff like that. So it's, I didn't go myself much into details. I use it a bit, but I found that really useful because I don't have to learn to download over libraries, over tools. Everything is there. And uh, just before finishing, a few, um, <coughs> a few more points that I did not expose here, but that are really useful and, and I think really nice. You have automatic type as derivation. Uh, at some point before, maybe you've seen that. Well, I don't want to go back, but basically there's a, a macro you can use to derive, for example, a debug. Debug is like show in Haskell. It's a way to display something. By default, you cannot. You need a, a type class for that. You can derive it automatically. There's a lot of other stuff you can derive automatically in the same way that you can derive a, a show in Haskell or, or stuff like that. Um, the concurrency model is quite sophisticated. One of the abstractions is called uh, uh, channels. It is a message passing style abstraction for concurrency, pretty much like Haskell, really. Um, the macro system is really sophisticated. Uh, it is hygienic, as they say, right? So you cannot write a macro that will actually generate code that will uh, fail at runtime. Everything is tracked, everything is nice. It supports recursive macro. It supports also variadic macros. It means you can have macros that have a variable number of arguments. So I'm not necessarily a big fan of metaprogramming, but here, you know, at this level, it can help a lot. And the way it's done, I think it's pretty nice. Um, la la last thing to mention, it's called uh, uh, Rayon. It's a library that allows you to do a parallel uh, iterators. Uh, so maybe you've seen that in Scala with the parallel collections. Uh, at Scala, I think you can do it as well. Basically, you can uh, um, do a map on a, on a collection and it will parallelize all the operations. That is really, really useful. 
But there's much more, again, but we don't have uh, uh, enough time to, to discuss uh, about everything. So yeah, so I hope you know that, that you see the motivation between, uh, between Rust and you know, even if you might look like a, a C, C++ replacement, I mean, the, the, the name of this, tro the, of this uh, uh, talk is uh, the Toll of, tro of Troy because I really think that this language is a, is a Trojan horse for a C++ C++ programmer for them to become functional programmers without even realizing they will become functional programmers. Because you've seen all these features, right? If you read the Rust book, it's not written the same way I explained to you. It's written in a way that is, you know, they're not talking about algebraic data type or anything like that. They really just, they don't want to scare C, C++ developers. So maybe that's why you never heard about it as a functional language. But I really think it is. And you know, you might have stuff in the past that you wanted to do uh, at systems level, but you never did because the tooling is, is, is crap. Well, I think now we can, and you can try with, with us. So that's it. If you have questions. Yeah, so, yeah, so good question. So how is um, type in France uh, implemented compared to other programming languages? Uh, so the main difference is that it's only local type in France. I mean, there's no way you could skip uh, 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 the definition of a, of a type in a top level uh, signature. From my experience, it feels better than Scala. You know, Scala sometimes uh, is not able to do the inference in, you know, you can infer in two direction and Scala, works well in one direction, but really bad in the other one, while Haskell is perfect for that. Rust is actually pretty good as well in that direction. Uh, maybe it's because there's no higher candidate type, I don't know, but uh, I would say it's, it's probably even better than, uh, than Scala in that regard, and especially for the associated types. That works really well as well. Right. No, no, no. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, is uh, you know, Scala is compiled to uh, to JVM bytecode. Does Rust do a translation to C or C++ in the middle? No. Rust goes directly into. Uh, actually, I don't know if you use LLVM. I don't think so. I think it goes directly into into native code. There's no C or C++. It's binary directly, right? Yeah. So I don't think they even use LLVM. It's directly like binary code. So I use LLVM. Okay. Good. Okay. Good to know. So it, yeah, yeah. So it uses LLVM uh, IR internal uh, intermediate representation, and then I get, the, I guess they get some optimization for free thanks to that. Yeah, it makes sense. Yes, you can. That's a really good question, and that's actually. So I didn't. The question is, uh, if I have a large uh, uh, C code application, can I call Rust from it? Yes, you can. You can also from C plus plus. Basically, what you can do is that you can expose Rust like a C uh, method. Um, I never did it myself, but it's something I want to do. The reason I want to do it is because, basically, just to explain the motivation, I wrote a machine learning library with Rust, and now I want to do Haskell binding to it. So I will look into that, but it seems totally feasible, yes. <coughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, you need to describe the FFI, the foreign function interface. You have to be explicit about it. It's not like all your function will be exposed. You have to tell how to expose the functions. And I guess there's some uh, specifics about Russell handling and memory management because you might be able, when you use FFI, to do stuff that might be unsafe from C. So I guess you have to be really careful. But I didn't go there yet. So uh, yeah, I, I think I think your friend is wrong because uh, <laughs> because basically, I mean, you know, what I was saying at the beginning is that so I, I'm not an expert in Go. I guess it's yet better than C++, but Go is really far from what you can have here about safety of resource management. And there is a blog post, this one, fearless concurrency in Firefox Quantum. Uh, you should check that. You should you, you read that. Go is garbage collected, and I don't think it have all the you know all these safety features for memory management. 
So if you look into this article, you will find you could you could try to say okay, because they explain exactly you know what kind of stuff they use from Rust that make it more safe. So it will be interesting to try to see if you can port some of this stuff to Go. And my guess is that no, but uh, no, no. Uh, from from what I understand about the previous failure that they had with C++, it was uh, it was about uh, uh, memory safety. They were not able to write safe code for memory while doing this complex parallelism in uh, in Firefox. Yes. 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 It's uh, yes. Exactly. Uh, yes. So the question is uh, is why using you know linear types or affine types? What does it give? Uh, that's a really good question, and that's one you see uh, as well on the DHC proposal because that people are wondering why do we need this? Um, here, really, I mean, here in the case of Rust, but it's, it's the same in Haskell. So. It's even better in a Haskell because here the idea is to is to be sure that you won't be able to read a file which is already closed. Okay, so this is the the feature you get from a fine type is really that is it? I will never be able to read from a file which was which is already closed because of the of the borrowing uh, semantic. Um, the the thing about Rust is that because it track ownership, even if I forget to close the file. He will do it himself because he has a concept of finalizer, uh, which means it's good to have a fine type. But in a Haskell, that won't work because what you want with linear type is that you want to force the person to explicitly close a file, for example. Um, but, but saying that I'm passing you a file object or a reference to a file right. object, you can do that only once. Does that mean you can read from it also? No. So, yeah, so it depends. Some operation, you can do it multiple times, some you can't. This is the key thing. If you pass file as a value, you can only pass file once as a value. But if you pass as a reference, you can do it any, 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 many times you want. Because when you pass a reference, you, 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 you pass the ownership for a temporary amount of time. So you let the person do the thing, and then you get it back. But when you pass as a value, it's lost. So it's only the last thing you can do to pass it as a value. So it forces you, but basically when you design your API, if, if there is a function that is a finalizer, is what has to be done at the very end of the resource, you make that function accept the value not as a reference, but you know as a value, and then the user will have no choice. You know, if you if you call this function, it will have to pass like that, and then it won't be able to use it anymore. Uh, the big difference with Haskell, though, is that in Haskell there's no finalizer, so you want to actually force the user to call that function. It's not optional. Here it's optional. If you don't call it will be released anyway. In Haskell, with linear types, they want to force the user to actually call it. And you force it to call it, and you're forced to call it at, uh, at the end. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. <coughs> it is complicated, but uh, if you want this trade-off, I mean, if you want safety and performance, it cannot be more simple yet. Maybe tomorrow, yes, but as of today, you know. So yeah, and, and it's, it's really true. The, the reason usually people rely on C and C++ is to do these things, right? Because they think they're smarter than the compiler or the anything. Oh yes, I can be smarter. I know I can deallocate here because I know what I'm doing. But you know what happened when programmer says, I know what I'm doing. You never know what you're doing, right? You, want, you need a compiler, you need a borrow checker. And, and, and it's exactly what you were saying. The borrow checker is doing that. It's like if you had a new phase in the compilation to check this stuff. I would say you hit the same bug you hit with uh, Haskell and, uh, and Scala, logical bug. I would say bug that you hit with Scala, logical bug, and then the lack of effect tracking. Maybe you might do something, and you didn't expect that. You know, you do it somewhere, and then in another context, you call that function, but you don't expect it to do something heavy. So that's the kind of stuff you you would have. But I never had any. Uh, 
memory issue, you cannot do pointer arithmetic. It's forbidden. There's no way to do it. So you cannot access an unsafe part of the memory. It's impossible. Right. Yeah, but why do they do it? I mean, that's a question. It would be interesting to, so the question is usually when uh, people do graphics or I guess video games and stuff like that, they use a lot of trick about uh, doing pointer arithmetic for performance reason. Um, that's, we, we need to see case by case, but that's where Rust sometimes is not faster than C or C++, you know. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes it is because uh, sometimes maybe you want to do this stuff, but it's too complicated for you to do it right, and maybe Rust will do it when it compiles. Because Rust has a really good optimizer, so maybe the optimizer will be able to do this. Maybe not, but yeah, no, it, it, it's a good point, yeah. Out, sorry guys. Well, feel free to catch me uh, just after in the, and I'm happy to discuss it more. Thank you.